Good morning, North Elliot. How are you? Are you good in the house of the Lord? Are you good in your own house there on Facebook? Good in your own house? All right. Amen. Amen. I'm glad that you are here, and I'm glad to be in God's house. No place like the house of God. Amen. I want us to enter into worship today with an openness to receive. I believe God wants to give us an infilling today. So I want us just to, from the very beginning, to just enter into this time of worship. Just say, fill me up, Lord. Here I am. Fill me up. Wherever I'm low, wherever I'm deficient, wherever I'm in need, give me that and to spare. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, we're going to do that, and we're also going to give this morning. You can give online. You can give in person. The information is there on the screen. If our ushers would come forward, I want to bless the offering today and just bless this moment as we make transition from what was to what is. As we move from the busyness of our morning to get to church and shift that mindset to worship. Father, right now, we bless you. We bless you with our lips. We bless you with our hands. We bless you with our offering. We give our tithe and we give our offering and we surrender it willfully. Hallelujah. Father, we also come to you in need. We ask that you fill us up today, Lord. Fill us to overflow and let it happen and let it start right now. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Good morning, North Elliot. Let's worship together. Come on, let's stand to our feet and worship him, amen. Stop. 
There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no law we won't tear down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no Die. 
to do, I believe. I believe the impossible is possible. You said it, Lord. I believe it. Amen. Hallelujah. You said it. It is done. Hallelujah. Would you just grab hold of a promise that God has made you right now? And would you by faith just believe that, incorporate that, and pull that into your heart and your life right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Got to silence my phone. Amen. Amen, amen. Hallelujah. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord and you can kick back with your coffee at home, whatever you're doing there. Thank you, guys. I appreciate that. I want to start this message this morning um, by asking two questions. By asking two questions. The first of which is, what side of the line are you living on? What side of the line are you living on? I I know the graphic is small, but I want you to see that it's a gas gauge. What side of the line are you living on? I don't know what the percentage would be in this building, but there's basically two kinds of people. The people who fill up their tank as soon as it gets past half or around half. And the kind of people that run it all the way until the light comes on. If you don't have a light, you just say, well, you know, I think I can make it. So this message today is all about you discovering which side of the line you're living on. 
Second question is, are you living on full or running on empty? Are you living on full or running on empty? According to research done by the AAA, 24 million American drivers continue to drive after the warning light comes on. Now, I don't know what kind of vehicle you got, if it's new enough for a warning light. My car, it's 50 miles to empty. Bing! Little gas tank thing lights up. 50 miles to empty, and it starts counting down. In orange, the more I drive, you know, 25, and it goes ding! You know, it's like, hey, did you miss the 50? Right? <laughs> Hello? Um, I can't help but think of a couple of stories <laughs> when I've ran out of gas before I had warning lights. But the story I think that fits really the best is I went to school with a guy that whenever his gas gauge would get on E, he would just take his driver's license out and stick it in the dash and cover it up and just keep driving. Can I tell you that that is not an answer? <laughs> ignoring the warning light, ignoring the fact that you're running on empty is not the answer. But I want to pull that over into the, to the spirit. I want to start by making a statement. The church of Acts lived on full. The church of Acts, the early church, the apostolic church, the church that Jesus said the gates of hell would not prevail against, that church, that first century expression, those 12 disciples that became apostles that all but John were martyred. The church of Acts lived on full. And when the Spirit came upon them in Acts chapter 2 as the fulfillment of Christ's prophecy, He not only filled the building corporately, but He filled each one of them individually. And so I want you to understand that the church of Acts, the corporate church lived on full, and the individual church member lived on full. I'm going to make several statements and use several scriptures. Let's just move through them. The disciples were filled on the day of Pentecost. Acts 2, 4 says, And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit that filled them gave them the utterance. The disciples were refilled a few days later in Acts 4.31 in response to persecution and threats. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. The first deacons were filled. Acts 6, 3. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Again, the deacons, 6, 5. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, faith, and the Holy Spirit. I want you to see that. And then it just goes on to name the other six. The first martyr, Stephen, continually or remained full of the Holy Spirit for on the day he was martyred, Acts 7, 55, and he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand. 
So not only was he filled with the Holy Spirit or full of the Holy Spirit to do the work of a deacon, even as a martyr, he remained full of the same spirit. Saul of Tarsus, who would become Paul the Apostle, was filled. In Acts 9, 17, and Ananias went his way and entered the house and laying hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me to you that you may receive sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, I can't help but wonder Was Saul's filling of the Holy Spirit a result of Stephen's prayer when he was being stoned? In Acts 7, right around the 60th verse, it said, Stephen, while they were murdering him, looked up to heaven and said, Lord, forgive them for they don't know what they are doing. Acts 1.8 says, and Saul was standing there consenting unto his death. Saul was in earshot. I just can't help but wonder, was Saul's salvation an answer to Stephen's last prayer? That God would intervene this man on the road to Damascus who would receive his sight not only physically but spiritually and be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Not only was Paul filled with the Holy Spirit, his traveling companion Barnabas was filled, Acts eleven twenty four, 24. And he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. That's powerful. And he, being Paul, not only received, but he instructed us. And this is really the verse that I'm going to talk about here today. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is dissipation or debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Paul said, don't be full of wine. Because it leads to sin. It leans itself toward sensual pleasure. What's he saying? When you get drunk on alcohol, you do stupid. Right? Don't get drunk on alcohol and do stupid. Get drunk on the Holy Spirit. Don't be filled with the spirit of this age. Don't be filled with wine or alcohol or spirits as they are called. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. This Greek word that denotes be filled is continuous present tense. That means be filled and continually be filled. It means to be filled and remain filled. Whatever you were filled with, remain filled. Tony Suarez says it like this. God filled you with the Holy Spirit so you would stay filled with the Holy Spirit. God filled you with the Holy Spirit so you would stay filled with the Holy Spirit. Maybe you're like those guys in Acts 19. Those disciples of John the Baptist only knowing John's baptism. Because when Paul looked at them and said, Have you received the baptism since you believed? They said, We've not even heard if there be a baptism. And so he explains to them Christ. He baptizes them in water, and all of the sudden they come up out of the water, speaking in other tongues, prophesying, and declaring the wonderful things of God. So you and I need to stay full of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit that filled us, we need to remain full up. So if you are like those 12 men, 
John's disciples and you've not heard of the Holy Spirit, I'm talking to you about it now. If you are fully Pentecostal and you've been raised in a Pentecostal church or you have a Pentecostal expression and you've not spoken in tongues in a long, long time, I'm talking to you. You need to remain full of the same Spirit that filled you. Right? You need to stay full of the language, meaning prayer. Did you hear me? I said you need to, to remain full of the language. There are three outright evidences in the book of Acts that they spoke in tongues. There are two others in the book of Acts that allude to the fact that they spoke in tongues. But the one that I want to talk about is where Paul tells us that the Spirit helps our infirmities. For he knows what to pray for when we don't know how to pray. For he gives us utterance or unction or groanings or words or syllables that we cannot form or fashion. That's what he does in Acts, I mean in Romans 8, 26, 27. We are given the ability to pray in the Spirit. If we are to remain full of the Spirit, we must pray in the Spirit. We must use the prayer language that we were given. You see, the power of a language is this. When you pray in the Spirit, you pray beyond your intellect. For the Holy Spirit who lives inside you prays past what you know. He prays past what you can say. He prays past what you can feel. He prays beyond you, but he must have you to pray it. Right? Likewise, the Spirit helps our infirmities, for we do not know what to pray as we ought to pray. Right? For the Spirit himself forms the words, forms the groanings. He pulls them out. Why? Because the Spirit knows the mind of God. So there's the second reason in the 27th verse. The Spirit knows the mind of God. When we pray in the Spirit, God's will is being prayed in a pure way. Now I'm not talking about tongues and interpretation in the church. I'm talking about devotionally. I'm talking about in your prayer closet. I'm talking about you praying in a language that you, it's praying beyond you. It's praying the will of God and it's praying beyond Satan. It's praying around the enemy. When you pray in an unknown tongue, you're praying in a language that Satan cannot interpret. And if he can't interpret it, he can't intercept it. Does that make sense? When you and I pray in English, the devil knows everything we're praying about and he's able to form a strategy against it. I'm not saying don't pray in English. I'm saying pray in English. But I'm saying also pray in the Spirit. Pray in the language you know and pray in the language you don't know. Remain filled with the Spirit. Right? Right? You need to do that. Secondly, you need to stay full of praise. Not only will I pray in the Spirit, but I will pray with the understanding, Paul says. I will sing in the Spirit, but I will sing with the understanding also. That's in 1 Corinthians 14, 15. Paul is trying to tell us something. He's trying to say something to us. He's trying to say, yes, you can pray in the Spirit, but yes, you can sing in the Spirit. You can sing in the Spirit. David said in Psalm 34, 1, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. This morning, uh, Dawn Wiles of Remnant uh, put on her Facebook page. I did a little screenshot of it so I could have it. She said, Father, we set the atmosphere in our lives, our homes, our minds this morning of worship and praise. Before we even reach the church building, our hearts and minds are fixed on you. 
Holy Spirit, rain down. Holy Spirit, rain down. Holy Spirit, rain down. Listen, if there's an outpouring, and I preached a lot about that last Sunday night, then there is an infilling. And we not only are filled with the Spirit to speak or to pray in an unknown tongue or a language we didn't learn, but we can also praise in the Spirit. And I can praise in the understanding. I may not know the words of the song. I may not know what the Spirit is saying, but I can know what the Spirit is doing. I can know that the Spirit is setting the atmosphere around me, that He's pushing the demonic powers back, and that He's releasing the angels of God to work on my behalf. We need to stay full of the language. We need to stay full of praise. But we also need to stay full of power. Did you hear me? We need to stay full of power. Jesus promised his disciples in Luke 24, 49. Behold, I send the promise of my Father. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. When I put this jacket on this morning, I became Pastor Ken. Oh, I was Pastor Ken already, but I became Pastor Ken. What am I saying? I'm saying when I put this jacket on this morning, I stepped into the office of pastor. When you and I put on power, we step into another realm. We step into another dispensation. We step into something different. We not only become who we are, but we become a fuller expression of who we are. And we walk in divine power and authority. Remember, it was Jesus who also said, But you shall receive power after or when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you shall be my witnesses, whereat in my hometown, in my county, in my state, in my nation, and around the world, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost part of the world, I am going to be a witness of the power of Almighty God. I am going to be a witness of what the Lord said was possible. I am going to do it. In Acts 4, 7 through 10, listen to what Peter said. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you healed this lame man? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people, elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man. By what means he has been made well. Let it be known to all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this man, this person right here, stands whole. You want to know what power Picks up lame people. You want to know what power heals the sick. You want to know what power opens the blind eyes. You want to know what power. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. If that same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwell in you, He will also quicken your mortal body, meaning He will enable you in your mortal flesh to do what you could not do normally. He will enable you by the use of Jesus' name, by the use of Jesus' blood, by the use of who Christ is and who you are in Christ, filled with the Holy Ghost. You can say to all of the doubters, you can say to whatever trial, you can say to whatever judge, you can say to whatever committee, if you're asking me how I do what I do, I do it by the Holy Spirit. The one that filled me on the day of Pentecost is still, he's still in me. He's still in me. The Apostle Paul, he's preaching and there's a dissenter. There's a man there named Bar-Jesus. 
He's a sorcerer. He's also known as Elemis. And there he's trying to keep the witness of Paul from being effective. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, Oh, you full of all deceit and all fraud. You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteous, will you not cease from perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And by the same power that opens eyes, and by the same power that opened his eyes, he spoke the man blind, and he was blind. God's serious about his gospel. God's serious about heaven and hell. God's serious about when we witness in the power of the Spirit. I remember September 1988. It was the eve of the eve, right? It was the eve. The eve. Yeah, it was the eve of 88 reasons why Jesus is coming back September 12th, 1988. Everybody ever see that, that book? I think he missed it. I'm just saying. There in the parking lot of Burger King, I'm preaching. I got 20 people. I'm preaching. Oh, I'm preaching. I said, I don't know if Jesus is coming back tomorrow or not. But whether he is or whether he isn't, you need to be ready when he comes. I don't know for sure if he'll come, but you need to know for sure if he comes that you're ready to go. And a fight broke out. And I lost 16 of my almost converts. But four of them stayed with me. And they prayed through. And that next night they were in church with me. I'm telling you, you got to stand tall when the times are different. I'm telling you, you got to stand in the spirit. If that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is in you, you got to stay full of the power. But not only was Peter filled, and not only was Paul filled, But all the disciples, when the Jews decided in Antioch, they didn't want what Paul was preaching. And they stirred up all the devout and prominent women and the chief men of the city. And they raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. Paul and Barnabas shook off the dust from their feet and they went to Iconium. But listen to this. All of the Gentile disciples, listen to this, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Oh, you can be filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. Somebody can say no to Jesus, but you can say yes to Jesus. Somebody can say, I don't want it. You can just say, bring it right over here. Put it right on my plate. You might not want tongues. You might not want praise. You might not want power, but give it to me. The disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Not only did Jesus promise it to his disciples in the upper room. Not only did Peter receive it and remain filled with it. Not only did Paul receive it and remain filled with it. Not only did the disciples become filled with it. The Gentile disciples become filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. The same promise is for you and I. The promise that was then on the day of Pentecost is the promise for us now. Acts 2, 39, for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Stay full of prayer. Stay full of praise. Stay full of power. I hear you. That's great, Pastor. I appreciate that. But you got to help me. Okay, I'm here to help you. I want to give you some reasons why you are running on empty. With all of that, And with all the promises that God has given us, why am I running on empty? Number one, assuming you have enough to keep going. That's the number one reason. 
oh, I got the Holy Ghost back when I was at youth camp. Oh, I got the Holy Ghost and -and so-and-so's revival back in the 90s. Oh, I got that, Pastor. Listen, you got to stop lying to yourself. (laughs) Acting like you got some kind of reserve tank in there. No, you done used up all the Holy Spirit. Right? You got just enough Holy Spirit to keep you saved. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. I'm sorry. I wish I'd have said it better, but I'm going I'm to hold, hold to it. I'm going to withdraw the apology. Number two, trying to fix it yourself instead of trusting in God. You run on empty because you seek solutions without the Holy Spirit. Number three, you keep long accounts. I had somebody tell me one time, Pastor, I know what the Bible says, but you don't know what they did to me. We need to flip that around. Pastor, you know what they did to me, but I know what the Bible says. Mm-hmm. Hallelujah, glory to God. That's what I'm talking about. You need to tear up all the logbooks that are in your mind and all the people that you're holding accountable. Oh, one day. Right? What am I on? Four. Avoiding church and other believers. I just got to tell you this, regardless of whether you think we know it, we know. We know you ain't all that in a bag of chips. We know you don't have it all together, so when you don't got it all together, don't stay away from church. Don't stay away from us. Come to us, because guess what? We don't got it all together. (laughs) The same Holy Spirit I'm preaching about for you is the same Holy Spirit I'm preaching about for me. Right? Hallelujah. 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 We're running on empty. We're running on empty because we're attempting to make improvements instead of receiving transformation. There is no solution for fixing or patching up sin. Sin has to be repented of, washed away, and transformation come. There is no home improvement on the old man. We've got to allow the Holy Spirit to totally and thoroughly cleanse us. Hallelujah. We're running on empty. But I also want to give you some ways to... Keep your life full. There are going to be more of these, so hang tight. Number one, surrender completely to Jesus. If you're here today and you're just churchy, meaning you feel like you should come to church because church makes you a better person, but there is still not a surrender to the Lordship of Jesus. Jesus said, many call me Lord, Lord, but they do not do the things that I command. Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commands. Jesus said, the first command is love the Lord thy God. The second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and commandments hang on these two things. Surrender to Jesus. Number two, receive the Holy Spirit baptism. Don't just receive a prayer language. Receive the Spirit Himself and everything He brings. Pray regularly and intentionally. These things keep you full. Worship privately. Don't let the church be the only place you worship. I mean, put on something. And I don't care what something is. Your something might not be my something. Right? 
Hallelujah. You might throw on Jimmy Swagger and be walking down the old sawdust trail. I don't know. You might like Maverick City. You might like Andre Crouch. You might like some of the modern stuff. You might like Elevation Hillsong. You may not like them. I don't know. But what I'm saying is, no matter what it is, worship privately. Read and meditate on the Word of God. Hey! I read a joke. It's going to go along with what I'm saying. I read a joke from a pastor. He said, I don't know why my wife gets mad when I continually refer to her as my ex-girlfriend. He said, it's the truth. Right? Now I'll tell you something. I've been married a long time, 33 years. And Twyla don't write the sweet things she used to write on my cards. I know y'all looking at me. No, I don't either. I just want to throw her under the bus first. Ain't that what you're supposed to do? Point at the other person, then you point at yourself. I know I do it too. Bus. You know. But the other day, I was putting away cards. I'm not a pack rat. I just save things. Any other person in here needs the Hoarders Anonymous. We'll, 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 H-A, we'll, we'll form that later. Um, but but, but I, I, I keep the cards. I keep the birthday cards. I keep the anniversary cards. And I, and I put them together. And I keep the cards that, that are meaningful. Things that people have wrote that are encouraging. And, and so occasionally when I'm packing them away, I read them. I read those love letters. I read those things. And then all something happens to me when I'm reading it. I fall in love with Twyla all over again. Even though she ain't being as sweet to me as she used to be. So why don't we read God's love letter? Why, why do we not read this? I'm telling you, if you'll read this book, you'll fall in love again. You know, this book, you know, it boils down to God's relationship with His Son. Right? It's a father-son book. And how through that relationship, God has redeemed or brought in many more sons and daughters into His kingdom. You know, we need to read and meditate on that book. We need to fall in love with Jesus again. <laughs> we need to go to church and fellowship with other believers. Now, I know that church it looks different in our day and age. Sometimes it's online church. Sometimes it's home church. I get that. But go to church. Fellowship with other believers. What connection does light and darkness have? What relationship does God and be all have? You can't have all of your relationships in the world and that not affect your relationship with Christ. So you got to find that balance. Number seven, share your faith. Number eight, forgive yourself and forgive others. Number nine, trust God in difficult times. Number ten, walk by faith and not by sight. Number eleven, know who you are in Christ. And number twelve, to get myself back on my point, I put it last, is stay near the filling station. And I'm not just talking about church although I am making a reference to church you know they used to call them filling stations instead of gas stations convenience stores whatever I mean 
you go to the ones now, I mean, QT, come and go, loves, I mean, they got everything under the sun. I mean, you can buy your wardrobe, feed your children, buy all the gifts for Christmas. I mean, you can just do everything. You just get gas. I mean, just do everything. Sometimes you go in there and forget you went there to get gas and just drive off. I mean, you see, my mom had a practice. And that practice was she filled up her tank every week when she got paid. And then she would fill up her tank any time we would go out of town. Because you never know. You might not pass a filling station. Now, I just got to go back to a story that I didn't tell, which was this. When I was 18, I had a car that's gas gauge did not work. So I drove until I ran out of gas. And I would carry a gallon of gas in the trunk for when I ran out. I'm not saying I wasn't prepared. I was a Boy Scout. Come on now. Somebody help me. Give me an amen. But that's a poor way to live. What I'm trying to say is, I just blindly went wherever I was going, and I would drive by. I would drive by a filling station and then run out. I mean, my answer was right there. I just passed it. It was five miles back. I could have saved myself. The inconvenience of pulling over, pouring almost a gallon of gas, because you got to save enough to prime the carburetor. Right? Right? Because you want it to start, not kill your battery. <laughs> so, in closing, I want to say this. If your vehicle needs to be filled up once a week, or when you're going out of town, so do you. I think my mom was right. I think my mom's practice was right. I think you have to get a certain age before you admit your parents are right, but you eventually do. Maybe they're not right about everything, but there's some things, some pretty important things that I found my mom was right. My mom knew that she couldn't drive to work on an empty tank of gas. My mom knew. I wish somebody was listening to me. My mom knew she couldn't get to her destination on an empty tank. My mom knew she wasn't going to get far out of town on an empty tank. She wasn't going to get to where she was going. She wasn't going to get done what she needed to get done on an empty tank. So I've come by today to say to someone, stop acting like because you went to church last week or last month or last Easter or last Christmas, you're good. It's a lie from the enemy. Stop acting like I read my Bible last week. Last month, once last year, that you're okay. You're not. Stop acting like you prayed once and asked Jesus Christ into your heart, but you've not talked to him in 20 years, so I'm okay. Even though Adrian Rogers was a Southern Baptist pastor, 
and a former president of the Southern Baptist Convention, even Adrian Rogers said, I wouldn't bet my best 15 minutes. on eternity to whether I'm going to heaven or whether I'm going to hell. I wouldn't count on the fact that I prayed once and that me and the person I was talking to were still on talking terms. I know I've heard a lot of things said and I've heard a lot of things said about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's a gentleman. He's not going to force himself on you and those kinds of things. But the Holy Spirit is going to put plenty of roadblocks in your way. The Holy Spirit's going to put plenty of opportunities in front of you you see if you're intent on going to hell you can go to hell but you're going to drive past every filling station every opportunity that the Holy Spirit has provided I'm trying to get somebody in this place in this room in this building don't bet on the fact that you prayed one time or that you went to church one time or that you know you just had a good day that you and God are on the right terms it's time to get filled with the Holy Spirit and the way you get filled with the Holy Spirit is you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior Brother Saul, the same Jesus that met you on the road to Damascus has sent me here that you would receive your sight and receive and be filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, I want you to be fully awake and fully aware. You can run on empty if you want to, but there's another way. You not only can be filled with the Spirit, you can stay filled full of the Spirit. You don't have to run on empty. Yes, life will run you down. That's why the disciples and the apostles continually prayed and they stayed near the fueling station. They stayed in the Word of God. You got to remember, they were writing the New Testament. They stayed in the Old Testament. Maybe they found themselves in Micah, chapter 3, verse 8. For I am filled with the power of God by the Spirit of the Lord. Maybe they recognized Isaiah 61, just as Jesus. For the Spirit has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Amen. Covering of sight to the blind, healing those that are bruised, proclaiming deliverance to the captives and preaching the great day of the Lord, that acceptable day, that jubilee. You can get filled. You can stay filled. You just have to decide. Last thing I'm going to say before I pray. Will you decide today to surrender your life to Jesus Christ and quit living it on your terms and live it on His? To the person who is a believer but finds themselves empty, will you recommit your life to Jesus Christ and live it on His terms? Will you make prayer and worship and Bible study and going to church a part of your routine 
Will you come to the filling station weekly to get what you need? Will you come to the filling station before you go out of town or do anything extra? Will you come? Will you make that decision? That's what I'm asking. and That's what I'm going to pray. Father, right now, in the name of your son, Jesus, every head can be bowed, every eye can be closed. We just do this for people, not for God. If you want to surrender your life to Jesus, raise your hand. You can stick it up and pull it back down. If you want to recommit your life to Jesus, raise your hand and then you can pull it back down. Amen. God sees that. Thank you. So, Father, first of all, I'm going to pray for the the lost because I can't see if their hands on Facebook. If you want to make Christ your Savior and your Lord, I want you to pray this prayer after me. I want you to say, Lord Jesus. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you are the Savior of the world. I believe you are my Savior. I receive you as Savior. I receive you as Lord. Forgive me of my sin. Cleanse my heart. I'm asking it in your name. Amen. Now for everyone that wants to recommit, Lord Jesus, I recommit today. I'm not going to keep driving by the filling station. I refuse to live on empty. I'm going to start living on full. I make a new and fresh commitment that you are my Savior and my Lord. Now fill me or refill me with the Holy Spirit baptism. Let's all just begin to pray right now. Hare.